This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. Welcome to WE380's Computer Systems Laboratory Colloquium, Fall 2012-2013. I'm Andy Freeman. The other course organizer is Dennis Allison. I want to thank Hal Murray for stepping in the last two weeks and doing introductions. Um, computer scientists are fond of making grand pronouncements. Um, one of them is Alan Kay's perspective is worth 80 IQ points. And this has been restated by the open source community as all bugs are shallow given enough eyes. We have a variation in the uh, funding now, in venture funding, called crowdsourcing. And I seem to remember the same concept in early 60s um, or before science fiction. Crowd, well, there's crowdfunding, I'm sorry, crowdfunding. Um, today's speaker, Raju Das, has taken this concept and applied it to real world phenomena to do experimentally driven scientific hypothesis, uh, hypothesis generation. And it turns out that by some measures, 37,000 game players can outperform a few hundred experts. Wow, sort of odd. So. Okay. Um, just a little bit of background on myself. I'm, I'm in the biochemistry department here at Stanford. I actually, I have a courtesy appointment in physics um, because my training is completely in physics. In fact, I did my PhD here at Stanford. And, um, but the project I'm going to tell you about is neither, really neither biochemistry or physics or electrical engineering or computer science. It's this very bizarre video game project that um, I started as a side project about three years ago. And now it's completely engulfed my lab, but in, in a good way. And in fact, that's why I was a little bit late today. It's because I was um, chatting with these video game players who are very intense, um, and I lost track of the time. Um, so uh, first, I need to introduce you to a spectacular molecule, one that I've been obsessed about for the last 10 years. It's called RNA. And it's the information-carrying molecule in all of our living cells. Um, it's composed of four chemical constituents. We label them as A, C, G, and U. And um, defects in how RNAs fold up and cut and paste themselves have been traced to an, uh, a huge number of, of diseases. Uh, one example is um, uh, childhood spinal muscular atrophy. Another example is Parkinson's. These are diseases of the brain or of the, of the neural system that have been traced to problems and how aberrant ways in which RNAs can uh, uh, fold up. Um, many, actually all retroviruses, including HIV and SARS and polio, their genomes are made entirely of RNA. And um, there are critical components of this genome that fold up into intricate structures and, uh, 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 and, and are necessary for viral infection and for viral replication. So one idea that many uh, labs around the world are, are tempted by or tantalized by is um, well, what if we could um, cure a, a, uh, a brain disease or defeat a virus by manipulating or disrupting these RNA components? And maybe even better, what if we could fight fire with fire? What if we could create an RNA device that itself then acts on the RNAs in the cell or in the virus and, um, and disrupts their folds? So this is what you might call the RNA design problem. And th there are many issues in, in this field, but at its very heart, there's, a, there's one kind of biophysical or even computer science-y problem um, that I'm illustrating here, OK? And uh, here's, here's the question. Um, I'm drawing here a shape that this RNA strand can form. Um, <coughs> and um, what I, the puzzle is this. You need to give me a sequence of ACs, Gs, and Us to fill in these blanks so that As pair with Us and Cs will pair with Gs. OK, and that's pretty easy to do. But the hard part is you have to give me a sequence that does not prefer to fold up into an alternative shape that also pairs up A's and U's and C's and G's. Okay? So that's the RNA design problem. And it seems fairly simple. And in fact, there are algorithms that can solve this through a kind of Monte Carlo um, process. But the problem in practice is not solved. And I'd like to illustrate that with a little, little quiz. So what I'm showing you here are two potential solutions to that problem. And I'm going to ask you just to look at these patterns of blues, greens, and yellows, and reds. And maybe try to guess uh, what well one of these folds up correctly, it turns out, we now know, and one of them doesn't. So just look at it and see, could you kind of figure out some differences between them that would tell you which one's right? Now, I'm going to tell you a couple of things while you're thinking. The first is that um, 
I, if I put these sequences into, there, there are dozens of web servers that, that will uh, predict RNA folds for you. Both of these sequences will, for any server, will fold up perfectly in silico. Okay? So no, no computer algorithm can tell these two apart. They both look perfect. Tell apart? Uh, what I'm trying to, I'm going to show you in a second that one of these folds up correctly and one of them doesn't when you actually synthesize <coughs> it in a test tube and see how, and see how it folds. So what, what, is, what is the feature or set of features that will tell me which one misfolds and which one folds correctly? So, so this is just a two-dimensional representation of... The molecule folds up in three dimensions, you're exactly right. And I've skipped over a couple of steps here. So, oh yeah, I wanted to say that I've only prepared about, there's about 20 minutes worth of slides. So I welcome questions <coughs> during, the, during the presentation. Um, uh, the real RNA folds up into a three-dimensional structure. Um, and uh, typically by folding back to form double helices, those double helices are represented here in the, in the schematic as, as these base pairs, as these pairings. Okay? Um, and the algorithms that we have for carrying out RNA folding um, um, are, are simplified, and they, 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 they don't take into account the three-dimensional path of the RNA. They make use of empirical rules for how strong these A's and U's and C's and G's are, and how strong some, and how good or bad it is to have certain bulged out uh, uh, letters. Um, and, but those are empirical. But they, uh, it's actually too, a little bit too hard for us to, to model these in three dimensions. That's actually what I mainly work on in my lab. I'm not going to talk about it here. But here's a question for you. Like, is, 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 is there any kind of feature here, even at this 2D level, that where you can, you can see a difference? Um, so I, I, I could quickly point out that this, um, this sequence on the design on the left, um, <laughs> it has more of these yellow letters, these A's, at the tips. Um, and in the central bubble-like region, whereas this one over here, um, the right-hand one is more diverse. And that could be good or that could be bad. You, you don't know. Um, any, any guesses for who thinks, who thinks this one on the left is the one that folds up correctly? Just humor me and raise your hand for one of them. All right, so we've got four people going for this one. And who thinks the one on the right? Okay, so the majority are going for the one on the right. Okay, so this is very interesting because um, uh, I've given this to a computer science audience in the past, and they got it right. But I think you guys got it wrong. <laughs> um, uh, the only way we can figure this out, no expert or computer knows which one, um, if any, pulled up correctly. Um, so we synthesize these in my lab, and we carry out a procedure called chemical mapping. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but they basically, it basically tells you each of these bands is an experimental readout of how reactive one of these letters is. They're called nucleotides. And um, the, if a letter is... Um, uh, reactive, th those should correspond to parts of the structure that are sticking out here. And letters that are unreactive should correlate to the parts that are paired up inside helices. And I'm coloring those as yellow and blue, blue respectively. For this design on the left, the uh, nucleotides that are supposed to be unpaired are largely yellow, and that's what we want. So this is about as good as it gets. While for this design on the right, well, parts of it are correct. Um, uh, this arm and this arm have basically the right chemical mapping pattern. Whereas in the middle, there are some differences between what we wanted. And so this RNA is more likely to fold up into st the structure I've shown. Okay? It's, it's misfolded a bit in the middle. And this is a small tweak, but even a small change like this could be fundamentally um, a fundamental flaw in any kind of new RNA device or, or therapy. Um, now the um, twist here, uh, which you probably anticipated, is the, the, the origins of these two designs the one on the right was designed by an automated algorithm called NUPAC, which is probably the most sophisticated method that we have today. It was developed by Caltech, uh, uh, Caltech Group over the last five years. And um, the one on the left here, the correct design, was created by a video game player named Penguian. He called the design Taipan. Um, and he had no prior expertise, he or she had no prior expertise in RNA folding or design. So this is a kind of anecdotal example of how um, video game players might be able to create designs that work better experimentally. And it's following in a line of, of, of very interesting scientific discovery projects um, that have emerged over the last 10 years. I'd say the, the first big ones of these came out of the astronomy community. Um, NASA, click workers, um, crowdsourced the analysis of images um, of, of the moon. Um, and this really expanded with the Zooniverse projects like Galaxy Zoo to encompass um, cosmological images of galaxies and, and even further objects. In 2008, um, a video game came, came out called Folded. I was partly involved in this. Um, that let players um, optimize three-dimensional folds of molecules, 
purely in silico. And um, this made headlines last year when um, some players created a model of a retroviral protease that um, uh, uh, actually solved what's called the phase problem for the crystal structure of that protein. And that was a problem that had eluded expert scientists for 10 years. Um, but the project I'm going to tell you about today is called Eterna, and it's really unprecedented in, in one major way. Okay? These, unlike the prior uh, projects, which were purely, they were, they were crowdsourcing purely in silico tasks, just computational tasks like uh, uh, optimization or image analysis, Eterna is unique in its inclusion of experimental bio bioscience. It's unique in giving players the ability to control experiments, come up with new hypotheses, and test them in the wet lab. Okay, and I'd like to show you how that works. Um, maybe I'll give you a quick demo of what the game looks like, just to make it concrete. And the question is, do I have an internet connection here? I should. Okay, I'll come back to it later then. I have a little movie so you can see what it looks like. Okay, well here's, here's the way it works. Every week we have a uh, challenge shape, okay? And we let players, they um, have access to this mildly addictive game-like interface to uh, create sequence designs. And then they have access to all the other players' designs and they vote on which ones they like best for that week. And then we take the top-ranked designs and then we synthesize them in my lab. Again, I want to emphasize this, that this is, the, this is the crux of the project. We actually synthesize these random sequences coming from God knows who on the internet in my lab. And then we <laughs> carry out these chemical mapping methods, and then we return those results back into the, um, into the game for players to see. The definition of best here is, um, well, uh, it's the experimental data. Uh, oh, best meaning which ones we synthesize? Yeah. Uh, those are ranked by players. What That's they whatever they consider best. Okay. Yeah. What if they decide they want to make a teddy bear instead? They can, as long as they get the other folks to vote for it. Okay. Yeah. Um, and we'll come back to that more. Okay. You'll, you'll actually see some okay. teddy bear equivalents so later in the talk. Mutual ignorance or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. You'll. you'll uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll show you some stuff later. Um, the. Uh, okay. So, as you can see here, we're we're going from hypothesis to. Um, experiments to uh, results back to the next hypothesis. In some sense, this we're trying to here crowdsource the entire scientific method on a video game kind of platform. Um, and now you have a target geometry and you're trying to find the sequence as opposed to the sequence and trying to find its folding. Right. Is that correct? Yeah. A actually, the sequence to folding, in, in, at least in this two-dimensional simplification, can be solved in polynomial time. But the backwards problem appears to be NP. Uh, uh, NPR problem, um, but but beyond that, in so the fact that it's kind of difficult and uh, computationally, there is this other issue where there are features that our computer algorithms and energy models are missing, and we're hoping that players can um, <coughs> figure those out by by doing experiments. So I'd like to tell you um, some of the first results from the project that emerged um, last year. We started launched this last January. Um, uh, this is the first target shape that we gave to players. We, it has three, we call it the, in the grants, we call it the three helix articulated shape. Um, but in the project the game, we called it the finger, because it has two knuckles in the, in the fingertip. And um, for all of these shapes, we have been, um, as a baseline, we've been uh, synthesizing designs made by automated computer algorithms. And um, in addition to getting the nuclear, the letter by letter chemical mapping, um, data, we also summarize those data into a one numerical score, and that's, for simplicity, I'm just plotting those scores here. They go from zero to 100. These initial computer designs were um, uh, sort of a, a, a mixed bag, where um, most of the player, well, most of these designs had scores around 90, so, and uh, 100 is best, okay? So most of these are, are around 80 to 90, sort of A minuses, B pluses, and a few are really bad. What does kind that of like score one. measure? That score measures the similarity of the chemical mapping pattern to uh, what we'd expect if the RNA folded up correctly. So it's basically a correlation score. Okay? Uh, yeah? How do you pick the shape? Is the criteria for yourself that you have to pick? Initially, they were, initially they were ad hoc. They were just, okay. I, uh, and you'll see that we tried to make them have more and more complex 
shapes. But there's no, I mean, there's no canonical series of shapes that anyone has come up with in the field. Say, yeah, this is the, the progression of harder and harder shapes. Um, you'll see later on, uh, if I remember, I'll, 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 uh, some of the later shapes were designed by players to explicitly test um, um, their ideas. So I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. But for this first series, we just had a list that we came up with almost randomly with pencil and paper. Um, this is how well the players did for that first, on their first, uh, uh, their first chance to get experimental data. Their designs um, were, again, also bimodal, like the computers. And in fact, you can't really tell there's no difference here. So, and again, none of these players, just like the computers, did, none of them created designs that were close to 100 or close to perfect. Uh, uh, close to perfect. Um, uh, but maybe that was expected, because at this point, the players hadn't seen any experimental data yet. Okay? So they're doing as well. Um, or as bad as the Aren't computer algorithm. Players also constrained by the model too. I mean, it's they're only creating structures which the model says will hold correctly. Yeah. So we. Yeah, that's right. So we um, decided to impose a criterion that uh, whatever designs are submitted should fold up properly given the computational model. Right. So if the computational model is wrong, then. Well, what yeah. we're hoping is that the players would find features on top that are beyond, that either um, are robust to errors in the computational models. Um, or they'd find sort of additional features, energetic terms in there that intuitively compensate for errors in the model. But the players have, addition, have, have a big handicap here in th that the programs have been designed by people who know a lot, and you gave them a 15 minute intro and some flashy stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And not even a gun. <laughs> not even a gun. To shoot the experts? Yeah, well, no, no. For, <laughs> it's a you know, video games, you know, first person shooter. <laughs> you didn't That's what you mean by not. They don't even have a VFG, yeah, and you're right. throwing them into the That's right. know, That's right. wolves. That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, here's what happened over the next few months of the game. Um, uh, yeah, we had no idea if this was going to work. That's why I said this was like a little side project. Um, anyway, uh, so what I'm showing here is the progress over the next six months, over six progressively more complex shapes. And I'll point out two trends. The first is if you look at these gray symbols, those are marking the computational designs. And they are getting worse and worse and worse as these shapes are getting more elaborate, more complex, with more helices and little junctions and things. Whereas um, the human designs are in colored points. And you can see that they've been basically monotonically increasing over the span of the game. So that by these last few designs, the first round designs by the players their median score exceeds the best score created by the computers. And typically, at least one out of their, in this case, eight or so designs um, um, is indistinguishable from perfect, given our, our experimental assay. Okay? So that's, that's what happened. Now the question is, how do they do it? And what we were um, uh, really excited by was uh, that the players were making forum posts and talking in chat, but they were trying to formalize the rules that they were using to create the designs for the next round. Question. And yeah. What does better than perfect mean? So uh, yeah, I'll, let me explain. So 100 would be perfect. Yeah. The experiment, the error, like if we repeat the measurements on, on, on uh, any of these designs, is the mean unsigned error is about 4%. Four, uh, 4%. So if you're above 96, that, that means within our experimental error, you're as close as we can tell from to, to perfect. And w for some of these, we've actually carried out further experimental methods that my lab has developed that are much more information rich um, and much better at falsifying these player uh, designs. Understood. The green line is not the perfect. The top is this, is, this is the range where is it, it's oh, indistinguishable okay. oh, from perfect, perfect given okay. this assay. Yeah, yeah. So they may, be, they may well be perfect. We just we can't tell. Okay. Does that make sense? We can't falsify those designs. Everything below the line we can falsify is having a problem. Yeah. Um, so how are they doing it? Um, and uh, I'll give you an example. This is a um, rule that was posted on the forums um, by a player named Eli Fisker. And uh, he said, all GC pairs um, in the multi-loop junctions have to turn in the same direction. Okay, GC, they're these red-green pairings. Um, and he said, you have to have them um, going from green to red and green to red clockwise around these loops in the game representation. Um, there's one exception, which is the green-red pair that's at the neck um, uh, can be go in either direction. Okay? So uh, if this sounds weird to you, it's, it sounds weird to me as well. There's no concept of turning in the same direction in the RNA folding literature. There's no 
this idea of a, a neck to a design, which is this longest range pairing, set of pairings in the RNA, that hadn't been identified as an important feature in, in prior work. Well, those bonds, some are double bonds, some are triple bonds, and they can sense direction, basically. They can. So the molecule, molecule itself is chiral. Yeah. So in, y y this is. Uh, so this there's no, so physically this is a reasonable rule. But the, do your computer rules have chiral rules in it? They do, the energetic, in principle, the energetic parameters that are in the in silico models, they distinguish between, um, they distinguish bet between these, those flips, of, uh, of whether the G is on this side or this side. Also the double, <coughs> double bonds are sensitive to charge the longer distance, if you wish, to the environment, they, and that, that has a topological impact. That, will, that presumably has an impact with, again, with prior experimental measurements on model helices. Um, there doesn't seem to be an effect beyond about uh, the nearest neighbors. But again, that could be, that could be because of the limited data well, set. Well, electrons going up to 60 code elements, so they can pick up some information. They, 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 they can, right. And there's also just Coulombic interactions. So it's not just neighborhood. There's also Coulombic, in principle, Coulombic yeah. interactions. It's very simple, basic. Um, so know. physics has quite a bit more that you're not having in the... It does, but I should say, again, I want to emphasize that in the models that are there in silico, um, in principle, they include these chiral effects. In principle, they can include these energetic effects. But the ones we have are based on experiments carried out by um, really great people like Doug Turner and colleagues over 20 years or so. And they've come up with these models that seem to fit the data. They don't actually include beyond nearest neighbor effects. That's partly because they don't have enough data to uh, uh, to figure out what those are, and also it's impossible to simulate. It's been difficult to simulate the energetics of these systems. So, what we we're hoping for with this project is that the players would intuit that there may be, as you said, non-nearest neighbor rules that aren't in the computational models, or rules about the chirality of these C CGs that aren't in the. Actually, there are rules for these CG chiralities, but only within helices because no one's carried out enough measurements of, for these more complex motifs to actually come up with a new rule. It's called a circulator, and that obviously has functionality. Yeah, it has it's functionality. Matter. Exactly, right. Uh, but it's, again, it's hard to design. It's, uh, I'll talk to you afterwards. Points. I don't want to slow you. No, I think, I think these are really important points. Yeah. So one thing that's interesting is the rules that players have come up with, when, you, when I read them, in retrospect, they seem they're reasonable, once I understand what their, their syntax means. There's a whole jargon that's emerged in the community and they've written lexicons to explain to you what a neck is and what turning is. But once I understand what that was, <laughs> then you can say, okay, this is in principle physically reasonable. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, okay. So, but is it, is it right? Okay, so I can say that here that Eli Fisher is the top player in the project. He's had the most designs um, synthesized and the most designs that have had uh, near indistinguishable scores. Um, uh, so this may have predictive power, but we wanted to really really rigorously test this. Um, so um, starting at the end of last year, we created an explicit game within a game, which we call the strategy market, where we rewarded players for um, proposing these kinds of rules in short, sort of 150 word snippets in English, <coughs> that we then coded up into, into Python snippets, um, where we uh, you know, which would assign a score based on the English description that you saw on the previous slide. And then we just used basic, you know, least angles regression or um, to, uh, to uh, find a linear combination of these scores that best um, explain the, previous, the data that we had to that point. And uh, then we coded up a really simple Monte Carlo algorithm um, we called Eternabot, which tries to optimize this player-derived score. Okay, so that we thought that would be a nice, um, uh, uh, rigorous, and um, uh, unbiased way to test these, these ideas. Um, so let me show you how that worked. On, um, Here's a completely new shape. Actually, this was a shape that was, uh, to answer a previous question, was proposed by a player as being probably hard for prior algorithms. So the, the shapes I'm going to show you now are actually all player proposed. Um, so we took, these are actually two d previous design algorithms, their scores plotted, and these are uh, the designs from some humans for this shape. And as I was showing you before, again, the humans are doing better than the computers. How did this new Eternabot design algorithm do? Well, it actually, surmount, it, it, it bridged the gap between the previous algorithms and these designs. We've now carried out these tests on um, eight different shapes. And in the majority of the cases, the, the Eternabot designs um, bridge the gap between the computers and the humans. There's still a couple cases where that's not the case. And we um, hypothesize that as we get more and more features, we'll be able to completely close that gap. Um, but one thing that's remarkable here uh, is that this Eternabot algorithm 
which is the distillation of, um, in this case, hundreds or thousands of people's ideas, um, it is the best algorithm that we have for designing RNA secondary structure. How many, uh, how many people's ideas? How many players? <coughs> there's now over 50,000 players. So last year, there was sort of about 30,000 players was the average number. Um, uh, not all of them, that, those are people who are registered. Um, about a tenth of those people play enough that they earn the privilege of, of submitting solutions that we, we could synthesize. Okay. And I would say within that number, about 100 people are really into it. Like they're making forum posts and um, coming up with strategies, et cetera. How do you recruit them? Huh? Oh, how do we recruit them? Yeah. Um, word of mouth? I, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so you have no idea who they are. They could be like people just randomly reading like tech blogs, or they could yeah. be like med students. They could just be yeah. Like, we started with. You don't really have a sense of. There's something interesting. Doing this. We, we started with um, when we were doing beta testing before the official release. We put some posts up on gaming blogs, like there's a, the Gameful.org by Jane McConnell, and we also put up a post on the Foldit uh, games blog. So we got some people there, some of whom we knew from we knew from before, Mike. My, my co-PI on this, Adrian Troy, um, he, he wrote the Folded video game, so he knew these folks. But interestingly, most of them, they were helpful in the beta testing, but they left. Um, uh, we found a really different community of players for this game than what we saw in Folded. They're, this community is much less driven by competition, and uh, when they've been interviewed by folks in the press, the first thing they tell you is not how many points they won, or where their ranking is in the game, they tell you how many designs they've had synthesized. And the thing that excites them the most is to see the experimental data for the designs that they, they designed. And so it's, it's remarkably similar to what I think drives me in science, which is like, here's my, my hypothesis. Is it right or wrong? I want to see the experimental data. I want the answer. And I'm actually also quite happy if it's wrong. And there's a very interesting that there's a, there's a large group of people, none of whom have academic science backgrounds, as far as I can tell from chatting, um, who have this, who get the same rush. Um, so yeah, I, I, it's it's, and they don't. It's I just was chatting with them and saying how how are we going to reward in this next part of the game? How are we going to set up rewards and stuff? And they're like, ah, oh, screw the rewards. It doesn't matter. Just get it running. We'll we'll play. Oh, well, synthesizing is the reward. The synthesis is the reward, yeah. Th well, that's for, for a brief thing. moment in time, they know something that nobody else in the world knows. Yeah. But that's an incredible rush. Yeah. Yeah. Are they all co-authors? Uh, <laughs> well, let's come back to that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, uh. All right. So the, um, here's the thing. So the game's been progressing really well. Um, but the hypotheses go well beyond what I described in the strategy market. There are r really... Uh, just beautiful ideas coming up. Um, there, here's there's one player, El Rapi, who says, I like the idea of shapes and constraints that help us discover where the model does not work. So she, um, he or she really wants to uh, uh, create designs that will actually fail in the lab. Okay? Um, here's um, an example of a challenge that they set up where they took the existing lab puzzle and said, can we make these designs just with two of the four letters, just A's and U's? Uh, uh, Here's another example of players. They're creating shapes. We have an interface where you can create your own puzzles in the game. And um, this is a, like a snowflake type shape that actually it's impossible for any prior design algorithm to, uh, to create a sequence that folds up into this shape, um, even just computationally in silico. Um, but um, like in this case, nine other players have found solutions for it. Um, and then uh, getting at the teddy bear question, some folks have been uh, you know, creating personal expressions. So this came out after Steve Jobs died last year. Uh, the player put up a, a design. Um, and I would love to know, and all the players would love to know, whether these sequences folded up um, in the test tube in the way that they've been designed here. But there's an issue. This is the, I, what I call the original sin of the project. Um, we actually haven't been able to synthesize these designs. Um, so the issue that we have is we now have over 50,000 registered players, kind of like what I was saying. Um, a little over 4,000 of these folks have played enough to um, submit lab designs. And we get for each, each cycle of synthesis, we get about 1,000 candidates now. Um, but we're only able to synthesize about eight a week. I have a, I have a pretty small lab, just started my lab. And um, uh, at least the protocol that we were using only gives, has, has this kind of a throughput. Um, 
So uh, we were getting a lot of uh, feedback like, oh, you know, you should, uh, you should have a, a class system where there are some expert players. You should always let them have designs and let the other people not have them. Or we were going to implement like a peer review where all the designs. So there was, there was a complaint that the eight designs that got made every work were, were by the most popular people and not by the smartest people. Um, and some folks were saying we should have a peer review system where every design, every, every one of these thousand designs has to be vetted by four or five other people before they get considered. And then I realized, you know, we're trying, that's a super hard problem. Um, you know, you have limited resources and a lot of people, it's really, you know, it's, it's a problem of political science. You know, Karl Marx couldn't solve it. How are we going to solve it? Um, but then I realized we could solve it. Um, so we, <laughs> we live in the Bay Area. And so some of us are techno-utopians. There should be a technological solution to the problem. And indeed, there is. You've probably heard in other talks um, in the series about the um, revolution that's going on in biology with um, the advent of really cheap nucleic acid synthesis, DNA and RNA synthesis, and DNA and RNA sequencing. Um, and it turns out that um, we've devised an experimental pipeline where we can take thousands, actually even millions, of uh, uh, designs and upload them to a website, the Agilent website, actually, <coughs> and they send, they'll send us back in the mail a um, glass slide that's printed with each one of those designs on the time scale of a few weeks. Um, and then we can transcribe the RNAs from these um, uh, chip-bound um, DNAs. And then the chemical mapping protocol I mentioned earlier, it turns out there's a way to read this out using these so-called next-generation sequencing technologies. Um, and so this is going to let us synthesize and get uh, structural data on 30,000 or 40,000 sequences per synthesis cycle. Okay? So we should be able to take anything that's typed into the video game and instantiate it in reality and tell you what the answer is. So it's, um, it's what I'm calling, um, it's like cloud computation, it's like, but it's cloud biochemistry. You'll, you're literally can, you'll be typing stuff into your laptop and then you'll get back um, an answer for what it did in the test tube um, a few days later. Um, so with this kind of throughput, though, it would really, it would be almost a waste to just have these one shape a week, you know, and okay, give me 30,000 sequences um, that fold into that shape. Um, since we have so many beautiful hypotheses coming in, I said there's a thousand designs coming in, we only make eight, there's probably hundreds of other ideas um, that are not related to the lab challenges. There's the snowflakes or those apple shapes. Um, what we'd like to do instead is to reward folks for what they're already doing. They're coming together and discussing very complex hypotheses um, that we could never think of. And we're going to reward them for designing experiments that test those hypotheses. And we'll run those as synthesis slots in our new biochemical cloud. Um, and then we'll reward them for writing little micro papers um, where, with starting with hypotheses, tests, data, conclusion, most of these fields will already be populated, right? Because we rewarded them for coming up with the hypotheses in the experiment. And these data will be coming directly out of our pipeline. So all they have to do is fill in um, a conclusion for what they learned. And you've got something like a little chunk of scientific knowledge. And then we'll be taking the top rank of these papers and helping edit them for peer-reviewed publication. Now, I want to emphasize something here. These papers are little micro papers. Um, they're, they're not going to cure cancer, OK? They're little tidbits of knowledge. Uh, on how to design a pseudonod or a five-way junction out of RNA. Um, but they are, th they are tidbits of scientific knowledge. They will have experimental data that falsify or validate what, what the folks are presenting. And when an expert researcher at MIT really is trying to cure cancer in two years, and they see, oh, I, you know, I really need to make this RNA into a pseudonod to deliver it to tumor cells, well, now if they type that into PubMed, our, the standard database in the biomedical literature, they'll get nothing on pseudonaut design. But in a couple of years, we think that they'll type that in and they'll get two or three papers by players showing you, here's how you do it and here's how you don't do it. We just played with this a year ago. Um, and I think that's going to be very powerful. In fact, you did a back-of-the-envelope calculation. If, if, this, if we can get this pipeline working, the publication pipeline working, um, We'll be, the Turner project will be creating experimentally validated knowledge at a rate that's one to two orders of magnitude greater than all current labs who work on RNA folding and design. Um, so that's the hope. And I think it's going to happen because, um, especially because earlier this year I asked folks, well, what if you were able to design anything you wanted? Just send us, this, just send us 
the sequences and some names for those sequences. And we got a list of, um, we cut it off at a thousand sequences. And here's, here's that initial list. And what completely floored me is that some things on this list, here's one labeled the L30E pre-mRNA kink term. I actually know what that is. That is a piece of RNA from our cells that I happen to be interested in. But it's, pr I, it's probably, probably five other labs in the world know what this is and care about it. But somehow a player of the project had been doing a database search and said, I really want to make this and see what it looks like in Eterna. And they typed it in. And that's when I realized that actually a substantial amount of number of the problems in my lab could also be mapped to this platform. And so this is no longer really a side project. It's really something that amplifies my lab. Um, and in addition, brings me into contact with hundreds of, of colleagues who, I, um, who are probably just as smart or smarter than the folks in my lab. Um, uh, so let me uh, just quickly summarize here. We started Eterna a couple of years ago in, a, in a hope to crowdsource the scientific method. And over the last year, we've started to see that um, non-expert players motivated by the thrill of, of synthesis are now outperforming computers at the problem of designing RNA secondary structures. And we're hoping over the next year to cr uh, harness that knowledge, um, not just in terms of one big paper a year, but in terms of do hopefully dozens of micro papers written by the players themselves. Um, and I want to welcome, uh, if, if any of you are interested um, in the electrical engineering or, or CS communities, um, the next steps in the project, um, we're trying to design basic elements that would be useful for RNA um, computers. And this, this goes back to um, creating devices to deliver gene therapy or to help diagnose cells that are going cancerous or infected by viruses. Um, it would be ideal to have RNAs that are act as logical elements that change their structure in response to what other RNAs are in a cell. Um, what the languages of that kind of RNA computer, what the fundamental components are, um, is not yet clear. But um, we have this really wonderful platform for creating those devices, whatever we think they are. Um, uh, and uh, in addition to um, this sort of nanoengineering um, type aspect, we could use help on um, the machine learning um, for creating automated algorithms from what folks are submitting as well. So if you're interested in any of that, please come in and talk to me. Um, so that's all I have. I, I do want to thank um, my colleagues oh. in the project. Our co my co-PI is Adrian Troy, who is a professor at Carnegie Mellon. Um, he's actually here in the Bay Area now. He's at Google X um, for at least a year or two. Ji Hyung Lee is his star graduate student who did all the coding for the project. And then Anne and Daniel and I took most of the data that I, I showed you um, for the project. And then, of course, I'd like to thank all the, the players who have contributed to actual designs for the, for the project. And thanks to you for your attention. What are those numbers beneath the players' names? That's how many um, nucleotides they have. That's the in-game currency. Which they don't care about. <laughs> yeah. So most of your pictures had a big circle over on the right. Mm -hmm. What's the significance of that? Uh, you mean the the shapes that we're trying to make? Yeah. The yeah. To the right of the next one's pictures. Um, yeah. Yeah. Most not all of them do. Oh, over here. Oh, that's right. So um, uh, in this two-dimensional representation. We're not, this is not the actual path of that RNA in, in three dimensions or in two dimensions. It's just a kind of uh, artifact of the, this common way to, s to schematize. But those strands are supposed, those parts of the RNA are supposed to be unpaired. Now, they all have that because we ask folks to design the RNA so that they begin with the letters G, G, and a few other nucleotides, and they end in a specific sequence because it makes our experiments easier. For example, uh, the, I, I I didn't, I, I'm happy to go into details, but you'll, you'll probably get bored. Um, uh, to carry out the chemical mapping, we, we reverse transcribe the RNAs, um, and that requires having a constant sequence at the end that we uh, can prime onto. So we ask players to take that into account, because that's the, what we're going to make. Is it really a loop, or you just not write it that for convenience? Does it count? The way it's drawn, no, no, it's not, it's not really a circle in, 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 in the test tube. It's just drawn like that. It, the nucleotide should be on pair, they shouldn't be contacting anything else. And when we, and when we do get data on those regions, they do appear to be uh, unpaired. So those ends can go anywhere. They don't have preferred locations. Sort of like saying the two ends 
a preferred location. So right. No. That's no, not no, the case. That's not the case. That's not the case. Sorry. So uh, thanks for asking that question. Yeah. So you're sort of giving us a false impression. Yeah. It's not. Yeah. Function, the other way, the other way uh, you can draw these is to draw these yeah. as coming off as straight lines or draw them as squiggles. There are different ways to draw it. This is just a compact way to, for the t for the presentation. So. What's the um, turnaround cost basically if you're doing a thousand sequences at a time? What's the economics of the whole thing? Oh yeah. Well, that's the thing. So the the cost of these. Um, the synthesis and the cost of the sequencing are dropping faster than Moore's law, and they have been for about the last, let's say, five years. Um, so that for to doing for doing thirty thousand of these at a time, the cost for th this is so great. Um, t if I s if I upload that uh, you know text file with a um, thousand um, or forty thousand sequences, the cost for that microarray is five hundred dollars. So it costs. Uh, less than a cent, I think 0.1 cents per DNA. So it's nothing, right? So that scales beautifully. And then the cost of sequencing are in that range as well. So per, that's, that's kind of why I call this a cloud biochemistry approach. Um, uh, it, these, many of the players wanted to, they got so obsessed with getting their stuff synthesized, they wanted to carry out these experiments in their garage or their backyard. And so we went through all the costs and I said, here's what you have to, you'd have to buy and to build your own lab in your backyard. And it just it ended up being very expensive if you're only making a few at a time. But with this economy of scale, with the sequencing and synthesis, by doing one experiment in my lab, I can do experiments for 100 or 1,000 people at negligible cost per, per person or per experiment. These, uh, these shapes are useful. Has anybody come to you and say, hey, can you try our shapes instead of you know those the shapes the you're ones. coming up with? Uh, yes, yes. So uh, but we, haven't, we haven't put them up yet. The, um, the, the really useful, so we started here with trying to predict a certain problem of predicting shapes. But the, 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 what everyone wants to do is to, to create sequences that change their shape when they see another a mo a, in a, a molecule. Like for example, you know, you'll put these into um, uh, yeast cells or bacterial cells, and you want the bacterium to swim towards a herbicide and eat it up when it sees that herbicide small molecule, and folks have done this. Um, and so that requires designing an RNA that changes its conformation when it binds that, when it sees that small molecule. Um, and so there, and, and th so these are switches. The ones that have been made that have worked in the laboratory over the last few years have required a huge amount of trial and error or um, very clever kinds of um, in vitro or in vivo selections. Okay. What we're trying to do is to find a way to do that without trial and error. So right now, if you play Eterna, if you play our lab challenges, the challenges actually are these switch puzzles, where we give you two, shape, two shapes, and you have to um, make the RNA fold into one shape one, but when it sees the small molecule, it'll fold into shape two. And then we're actually s mapping their structure in those two conditions as well. So that's been really interesting. Um, and it turns out that's a problem that is um, even harder than, the, even computationally, it's an, an unsolved problem to do that multi-state design. Yeah. What tools do the players uh, actually use on their, on the client side, and hmm. what would be even better? I mean, what do you envision as, as enhancing their abilities? Yeah, uh, I just, yeah, that's what we were talking about in this chat. Um, the players, we give them access to these folding algorithms. We um, give them access to algorithms that estimate how um, not just the probability of seeing their structure, but the probabilities of seeing other um, misfolded structures. Th you can, those can be est the partition function for the, um, the folding can be estimated, and that's given to players in silico. And they can visualize it in a certain way. Um, the players themselves have often made use of other servers that are available for RNA design or for folding. You know that's a strange world where you just say RNA servers that are available. <laughs> yeah. So, so sorry, the servers for computational RNA structure prediction and design. There's there's dozens, and we don't, you know, we can't impose any restrictions on what people use. So there are fascinating posts where some player has gone through every design that was submitted for a lab puzzle, and they've run it through this other server, and then they post what they what they got on the other server. Like, is there is there some extra meaning we can get? So that's what folks have. Now, I think the really important next step for the game is, um, in terms of creating tools, is to include, and the players are demanding this, they want their own scripting interface and the ability to create their own tools and to share them. Um, 
and that's been very important for the folded project, for the protein 3D folding project. Um, I, it's going to be, I think, transformative here as well. Um, yeah. Can you give us an example of one rule somebody came up? Hmm? How many rules people have come up with? Um, for, the, for the studies, for this um, study that I showed you, uh, um, for this Eternabot algorithm, we, took the f we had about 40 rules when we sort of froze the algorithm. Um, I think now the number of strategies, there's about, um, there's probably 100 to 200, um, if not more. I haven't checked. But um, because we have volunteered to code everything up into snippets, um, we haven't been able to keep up with the number of strategies coming out. That's also why we want to create these in-game in scripting languages so that the players can, it scales much better if the players themselves are scripting their own ideas. You analyze the rules. Could they be kind of like make a much smaller set that can <coughs> do the same thing? For yeah. I, so I didn't mention this. We've done for the Eternabot algorithm. We actually made we made three versions. One version we did um, you know, Lars least angular regression analysis. We picked. Yeah, it ended up being seeming like the top five uh, rules. You could find a sparse subset that that accounted for most of the variation <coughs> in the data. So we created an Eternabot algorithm just using those five. We also did a regression, a really simple regression, sort of an, a least squares regression, and then we used all 40 rules. And we had no clue which or if either would be good, right? And we thought, well, if all 40 of the rules were important um, and that, that algorithm did better, then we'd have to say, oh, it's really the collective intuition of all these folks. Um, but we secretly wanted the, the top five rules to be the best because that's simpler and easier to write in a paper. But we ran, we created designs with both of them. Um, I'm showing here the, the green symbols here came from the sparse set, the sparse one. Um, and uh, for simplicity, I didn't show the other one, but it is, it's almost exactly the same performance. Yeah. Why would least squares be the right metric if you have, have a bunch of programs, whatever, you don't compare programs I'm sorry, it was least squares <laughs> metrics? No, no, sorry. It was least squares, but regularized with, uh, uh, you know, like an L, like a, so that the co by the sum of the coefficient squared. So. Still, that's uh, yeah. I don't know. It's, the kind of it's totally, it's totally arbitrary. Is it programming or it, system? Yeah, it's totally arbitrary. You, you yeah. can use an L1, which is sort of the, sort of the um, you know, Lasso style analysis. There's, There's lots of things you can do. Um, that's why I'm saying, um, especially when the experimental throughput goes gets much higher, it would be great to have test dozens of automated algorithms that use whatever your favorite, most sophisticated machine learning algorithm. And we can test them all. We can, yeah, that's, that's going to be fun. Uh, this, this whole premise sounded like it was, you were basically assuming that the structure you get is only a function of the, the actual sequence, right? Couldn't it also be a function of processing conditions and things like that? It, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Um, for all of the cases I showed you, we've actually carried out measurements in two different solution conditions that are often used in RNA biophysics, and for almost all of them, the, the data in the two conditions match up. Um, so uh, there are a few exceptions, and I haven't talked about them here, but uh, they, those might be really interesting. Um, uh, but um, yeah, so the solution conditions, would in principle, do matter. Um, I assume we couldn't look at kinetic folding with this. I mean, it would be a little complex. Yeah, it, it turns out there aren't very many good experimental tools for monitoring RNA folding while it's being transcribed, or RNA folding as it's, as it's folded. That's another big area in my lab, that my, the real science that we do. Maybe that's what the game I should what? find better programs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm missing not, it. But not too many of them have programming expertise. It's kind of interesting. I just, I just actually did this quick s survey of folks who I was chatting with. And probably out of the 20 people I was talking to, maybe two of them had programming experience. So if you impose that constraint, restraint. Well, you'd have to do a channel interface. But you'd have to basically, what? one way or another, sooner or later, you have to get out the programming and start. Mm -hmm. So after you get back these big pile of, of things that are so cheap, what do you do with them? We, uh, uh, we synthesize them, and then we carry out this chemical mapping procedure. Which but how much is that going to cost? Or how much time does it take? That doesn't take very long. It takes um, about 
one day of us doing stuff and then one day of sequencer time. The cost is um, right now about a thousand bucks and it's dropping precipitously. The reason that these, the cost of this stuff is dropping so precipitously is because of the um, economic demand from whole genome sequencing. The idea that if you walk into your doctor's office with your genome, they can create a personalized therapeutic for you. You know, oh, that you have, or they can sequence your, your genome and your cancer genome if you have a tumor and say, oh, that tumor has these five mutations. I know right, exactly the right drug to go for. So there's, an, there's a tremendous economic demand for these technologies. And we are just writing one the coattails. One companies one wants to be able to do that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Weed out the bad, yeah. expensive customers. Yeah, I don't want to talk well, about that. Well, just charge them the expected cost. It's okay. No, you get the right answer. Insurance companies make, can make money on high-risk high risk people as long as they charge them correctly. Sure. We can say that actual DNA break pieces of it and give it to people, see if they come back with it. Real DNA. You're saying, should we send them samples in the mail of <laughs> the nucleic, of the <laughs> molecules? Yeah, well, just the mapping of the whole DNA, uh, pieces of DNA, specific gene, and so oh. they pull this correctly. Right? No, that's a, that's you no, know, that's that's uh, that's something. Um, I've been yeah, that's what I was saying about having this interface with the real science in my lab. We yeah, we're collecting those kinds of data on viral genomes or parts of the RNAs in our cells. And um, yeah, I, th I think in the next year or two, we'll just post that online and let people look at it. But then it might even be silly, though, to do that, because the players themselves will be probably more interested in their own projects, right? They're going to have the power to. I was trying to get at something different. Yeah. This is converging somewhere, not clearly toward what nature would converge to. Right? Oh, uh-huh. Oh, you're saying just what, what do natural RNAs look like in this? Are they correctly all there? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, right, yeah, one thing I didn't mention is that for scoring these designs and so forth, we, we have benchmarks based on natural RNAs that fold up these shapes that have um, been crystallized. Um, their structures have been solved through arduous efforts. Um, um, and that's actually, again, that's what, like, what I, that's my, the bread and butter in my lab. So, that's, how, that's why we developed these methods and made them reasonably fast and efficient. Um, uh, but we haven't made that, those data available, easily available to the players within the game. They have, uh, they have, they actually sometimes they read papers in my lab, so they, 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 they know what the data is, but. So that's um, a cheap way of, of boosting your citation score, or your, your reader score <laughs> on EPO. A, a, reader, a reader score, yeah, yeah. What, what's FMN? Oh, sorry, FMN is called flavin, uh, that, that's a, yeah, that's a fun little thing. FMN is flavin mononucleotide. It's a, um, a molecule that's present in all of our cells, um, all living cells. It acts as a redox cofactor, meaning it's, electro it's an electron um, donor or acceptor in many, chemical in many enzymatic reactions. And um, um, it's, a, it's just a, a favorite metabolite or small molecule that biochemists play with. There's an RNA sequence that's known that specifically binds FMN. And one thing, um, this, is, this is more for the biochemistry aficionados, of which there are probably none in this room. But uh, 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 we have challenges where this, they, in, in they harbor one of these FMN binding sequences. And then we check, not only does the RNA have the right chemical mapping pattern with the assays I told you before, we can check and see whether they actually bind up the flavin mononucleotide mo molecule. In other words, is this RNA acting, is this sequence acting, folding up so correctly that it scaffolds this shape? And it turns out by measuring the affinities uh, to <coughs> FMN, um, if the FMN is a hundredfold worse than you than expected, it tells you that the correct structure was present only one percent of the time. There's a nice statmec relationship um, between the two. So that was that was actually is an orthogonal way to test the accuracy of these designs, um, where again the players somehow are doing better than the computers. Yeah. You're only looking at the sort of the minimum energy design, really, because there could be all sorts of secondary designs that are just a little bit higher. You mean folds? Fold, yeah. yeah. Well, in the test tube, we're looking at everything. <laughs> with that You're looking at an average and ensemble average of all the different we are. potential folds. There. We are. In the test tube, we are. And then within the game, what we present to the players for their sequence is the minimum energy fold. But they can click on the button, and they'll get information on also the suboptimal folds. And many players use that information. So I guess on the internet, 
No one knows if you're a dog or a RNA designer. <laughs> <laughs> sort of cool. Okay. Yeah, I'm good. And now the cool stuff happens after the camera goes off. <laughs> okay. <laughs>